Well, good morning. This morning I want to talk about Esther, and it's kind of a short book, so we should just read the whole thing. No, well, I wish we had time, but I'll do a short recap, but I want to show how God is providentially using uh, two exiled Israelites to rescue his people from certain doom without any explicit mention of God or his activity. That's, that's, uh, if you didn't know, the book of Esther contains no direct references to God. And uh, it's kind of a, an interesting book. The, it's an invitation for us to look for God's activity, not just in the story, but also in our lives. And uh, it contains some various literary uh, devices like coincidence and ironic reversal, like you see here in the picture. And, but there's also a lot of moral ambiguity. And I think this is directly representative of what happens in our life. We, we read the stories of the disciples and Jesus, and they're always uh, learning the right thing to do and doing the right things most of the time, not all the time. But uh, in this story, there's a, it's very specific. This person is in the middle of a very uh, idolatrous and... Uh, there's a lot of other words we could we could use there, but uh, there's a lot of drinking, and there's a lot of sex, and there's a lot of murder going on in here. There's a lot of violation of the commands of the, this says Torah right here. Uh, so these were not things that God looked on highly, but there's a lot of it in this story. And so I think we can relate that to our own lives, because there's a lot of that in the world around us today. And so... Despite being in exile and the absence of God being mentioned in this, and Israel had morally compromised themselves, um, God doesn't abandon his promises. And so let's, uh, let's look at the story of Esther. So the, 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 the book of Esther begins with a six month, six months, six months, maybe I should say it again, six month drinking festival. This was not something that was like, oh, we're going to go have a hardcore weekend. No, this was a 180 day drinking festival. And so it was a festival that was given by King Ahasuerus for the army of Persia and Media and the civil servants of those provinces. There was 127 different provinces in uh, Media and Persia because the Median Empire and the Persian Empire at this point had combined, but they weren't quite the Babylonian Empire yet. And so uh, this giant festival was concluding with a seventh-day especially especially intense drinking festival and for the inhabitants of the capital city let me go back to the first slide here the capital city which is Susa which is the Persian capital and the rich and the poor were invited to this feast and uh, there was also a separate feast that was given by Vashti the King Ahasuerus's wife at the palace and at this feast Ahasuerus gets thoroughly drunk and at the prompting of his buddies of his fellow courtiers the people in the court uh, he orders his wife Vashti to display her beauty before the nobles and the populace and this is up for some discussion but in the first chapter here, he, he asks her, uh, let's see here, in verse, he asks to bring 
Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown. So it could be understood that she was to show up in just the royal crown and no clothing. And so he wanted to display her beauty, whether it was in the nude or whatever, to all the people. And she didn't want, she didn't want to be displayed that way. And so she refused. And once she refused, uh, the king's advisor said, hey, this is not good because you know, the subjects in the kingdom might get the same idea that they can refuse your orders. And so he puts her away and he orders uh, all the young handmaidens to come and be presented to him. And Esther is chosen as the most beautiful among them. She was orphaned at a young age and Mordecai was her cousin slash uncle, first cousin, and he was uh, fostering her, he, he, she was, he was her foster father, and and um, but she finds favor in the king's eyes, and he, she's made into his new wife. Important to note, though, that Esther does not reveal that she is Jewish, and this is important for our what we take out away from learning in this story. We're going to find that out a little bit later. But uh, shortly after this happens, after she's named queen, uh, Mordecai discovers a plot to place, sorry, no, discovers a plot to kill Ahasuerus by two palace guards, Big Than and Teresh, that's in, starting in uh, chapter two, halfway through chapter two. And they're apprehended, and they're hung, and Mordecai's service to the king is recorded in the daily uh, record of the court. They kept daily records, just like we do, just like they had a, uh, an ombudsman and a, a, what do you call the person taking the notes? Not a scribe, but uh, in a court. There you go, stenographer. They had a person there taking notes about the, and keeping a daily record. And... Uh, since the king was informed through Esther of the conspiracy, uh, Mordecai was the one who brought about the execution of these two conspirators, and it was recorded. But the grand, uh, so enter a new character, Haman the Agagite, and this is a reference to King Agag. Uh, he's a a descendant of King Agag, and that's going to become important later on in the grand scheme of the Israelite story. But he's named to the position of Grand Visor, and he commands Mordecai to bow down and worship him, to prostrate himself to him. And Mordecai refuses, and Haman informs the king that all of the Jews are like Mordecai and are useless and turbulent people and they are inclined to disloyalty. I'm trying to, uh, I didn't write down the verse. I apologize for that. Uh, chapter three in verse two, halfway down verse two, it says, for the king, or let me just start verse 2. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. And they told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews and the people of Mordecai 
throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And so, Haman goes to Ahasuerus and he convinces him that all the Jews are useless and they're a, 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 a turbulent, I think the New King James or the King James uses turbulent people who are inclined to disloyalty and he promises to pay 10,000 silver talents to the royal treasury for the permission to pillage and exterminate the Jews. And so the, the king issues a proclamation, you know, just like Haman wanted, for the confiscation of Jewish property and the extermination. The question is, what will Esther do about it? Because she's a Jew, and she is second in command to the king. So what will she do about it? And I want you to place yourself, of course, I want you to put yourself in the role of Esther, not in the story, but in your daily life. What will you do about it when you're faced with trouble in your life? And of course, we're going to go on to the famous, the famous verse here in chapter 4, uh, verse 13 and 14. We're going to get to that here in a second, because Mordecai is going to ask Esther the same thing. And Mordecai would not bow down and pay homage to Haman for specific reasons. And I want to point those out. So there's three main points in this lesson. What not to do, what to do, and how to do it. So Mordecai wouldn't bow down, like we talked about, and it was for some very specific reasons. The first reason was he was not a servant of the king, and he was not obliged to obey civil commands that would undermine and destroy the relationship that he has with God and, and, and his spiritual relationship. So the first lesson for us is we don't bow down and worship earthly kings or presidents or anything else because we are, that's not who our higher power is. The highest power in our relationship is with God. And so we can't do anything that will compromise that relationship, whether that's uh, calling somebody on earth uh, a god. I mean, that sounds obvious, right? We don't, the president's not God, he's just president, right? But some people treat that position like it was something higher than just a man. And um, we need to watch out in our own lives. And so the second point I would make is that we can't give in to peer pressure. This is a, a point that I was thinking about that, you know, I don't see a lot of people mention. Uh, Mordecai refused to compromise the, the priority to be a servant of God. And I mean, God had commanded them to do that. And so do you think that, do you think that he might have, uh, some people might have come up to him and talked to him about it? Do you think that? Uh, do you think that uh, some people might have tried to convince him to bow down? That maybe his behavior was going to cause problems for the entire Jewish nation. Do you think that they might have tried to put some peer pressure on him? Like, let's look at some other examples here, and, and I'll t kind of show you what I mean when. When Daniel was kidnapped and taken to Babylon, he refused to eat the king's portions of the king's meat that was given to him. And he refused to stop praying and worshiping the God. And he didn't stand for truth in the back room. He didn't, he didn't hide it. Instead, he did what he had always done and he knelt in, in front of his window when he prayed. And he wasn't going to change that because of peer pressure, because of what other people thought about him. Uh, and his friends, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They refused to, to bow down and worship idols uh, and, and the gods of the, the land. So they refused to compromise to the expectations of what God has for us. And this really infuriated 
of course, Nebuchadnezzar, but it didn't change the hearts of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just because the leader was, was mad and he was mad enough to try and kill him, it didn't change their heart. They didn't allow that peer pressure to get to them. And so when we look at our current study, though, like uh, in Esther here that we're studying, the, the servants of the king were threatening Mordecai daily uh, with consequences of that, that civil violation. Remember, it wasn't, it wasn't Haman who noticed that Mordecai wasn't bowing down to him. They went and ratted him out. And this was after they had told him that what he needed to do to make it right. And the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to him, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. They were testing him. So the question is, in our lives, do we bow down to the pressure of the test? There's a, there's a wise saying that says, pride goes before destruction. That's Proverbs 16, 18. And the life of Haman really is, is really demonstrated by the truthfulness of that statement. And, and he, he died on the, the very gallows, the very place he had set up to kill Mordecai. He died in it. And so in order to save the Jews, Mordecai, the cousin of Esther, and the one who had raised her after the death of her father and, and mother, he, he went to go seek her help. She inf and she, of course, informed him that she hadn't been called into the king's presence, and if she went, it could mean her death. And then Mordecai replies, and so this is the famous verse that I, I was trying to mention earlier that I, I did mention earlier sorry do not think to yourself that the king's palace in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews for if you keep silent at this time relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So the question is, what are you going to do? The question, is, the question is not whether or not God put you in the situation you're at right now. That's not the question. Because the answer is, he did. The question is, what are you going to do about it? If you keep silent at a time like this, if we keep our faith in the closet... God's will is going to be done. It's just going to be done through somebody else. But the consequence is going to be on us. And so Mordecai wanted to change what was going on. Certain death had been proclaimed. Let me, uh, let me read that. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews in verse 6 of chapter 3. The people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And so what not to do is we don't bow down to the worship of earthly kings. We don't give in to peer pressure. And we shouldn't be blinded by the consequences. The consequence here was the destruction of his whole people. But we can't let that blind us from doing what God wants us to do. And so what we need to do then is we need to stay the course. Haman's office... And I want to make another analogy here. Haman's office sent out letters to every Jewish household or, or every town, clearly explaining their demise and their temporary lives. He, he told them that he was going to come kill them, and he told them the day that he was going to come kill them. And everyone would die because Mordecai would not bow to Haman. Do you think that it, this is what I was, I, I 
got my notes out of order there. I apologize. But this is what I was talking about earlier. Do you think that it was possible that Mordecai was confronted by some of his brothers that maybe he had made a rash decision and he needed to change his mind? You know, they probably need to rethink it a little more. Do you think that maybe somebody might have suggested that he would apologize to Haman and maybe these things might not come around or he might change his mind? Uh, in, in chapter 4 there, it, as we, we're moving along here, it, chapter 4 really describes how all of Israel is mourning over the news. And, and Mordecai dresses himself in sackcloth and ashes. And this was, a, this was a symbol of his distress. But he didn't waver a single inch from what the standard of right is. And it meant that his brothers were going to be affected by this. But the consequence of rejecting God and compromising the principles of God's will was certainly going to put forward a greater punishment than what they were facing. And after, of course, now we're getting back to the story of Esther. After preparing herself to appear before the king and the king granting her favor, uh, she's going to devise a plan to save her people. And Esther was, was really courageous when she said in verse uh, four, or chapter 4 and verse 16, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, that's the capital, remember, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything Esther had commanded him. So her bravery and her faith in God are a testament to the trust this young, this young woman had in God. And I, I think that's really a wonderful example for us to follow also. That when we finally decide to stay the course, when we finally decide to trust in God, God is going to take care of us. And that doesn't mean that you know, we're going to have a nice fat bank account. That doesn't, that's not what that means. That means, though, that God's protection in his word is going to be on us. And as Christians, we have been saved by God. And we're also called to do something. Let's read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 8 through 11. says therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our lord nor of me his prisoner but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of god who saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in christ jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. So as a Christian, we've been saved by God, and our question, that is in Esther 4.14, Remember the question Mordecai asked Esther, verse 14, chapter 4, says, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You notice there's no mention of God there. But who would have sent her to the kingdom at, at that time? Specifically at that time. Well, the answer is God, and it, it emphasizes an ex that really this emphasizes an example of God's perfect timing in the lives of believers. And Mordecai is urging Esther to trust that the Lord has placed her in the position of influence to accomplish 
that very thing at that very time. And so the lesson for us is there's certain things that God has for us to do. And the question is, will we do it? And how do we do those things? Well, we do them. We look at our situation and we look to see how we can spread God's word in our home, at our work, as a neighbor, as a member of the church. So, I mean, have, have you ever really thought of that? Have you ever thought about where you are in your home or at work or the, these things? Have you thought about why you're there? And that maybe it's because God placed you in that position of influence to accomplish some task for him in the lives of those people that are around you and I don't think that we should ever forget that God is in control and that when we talk about the providence of God here I have it on the slide when we talk about that there's over 170 places in the in the scriptures that talk about the providence of God and so we need to remember that we serve the almighty God the, the one who created the world and created, like we talked about in the class, created a pathway for us to be saved, for his children, to become his children. From before the world began, he created that. And so we need to remember that we serve that almighty God. And we don't ever need to forget who we are and what God has done for us to know that we can belong to him to accomplish his purpose. And so... We can, we, never, we can never forget that God's promises are not only there for us, but, but that his promises are trustworthy. So we can't give up and wait, and wait for God because uh, Isaiah says in Isaiah f- chapter 40 and verse 31, Isaiah 40 and verse 31. This, of course, is an often quoted verse, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like an eagle's. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. So we don't need to give up, but we need to we need to wait for the Lord because the Lord is going to give us strength. And he does that through his word here. And I really like how the, the, the New King James I, has it uh, written here in uh, Esther 4.14, or sorry, 3.14, uh, when it says, A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. This was, this was the document that said that, the Jews were going to be destroyed. This is that document. A copy of the document was to be issued. So I, I wonder if the people of God, if God's people became more fervent in prayer when they got that letter. You think they, you think they prayed a little more when they got that letter that said they were going to be destroyed? What about, I wonder that if, uh, if songs were lifted to heaven in, in praise of his name, I wonder if they were attended to more seriously after that letter came than they were before. I wonder if the people of God attended to the law and, and, and looked at its teachings a little more closely after that letter. And I wonder if the attitudes towards each other, you know, what their attitudes were towards each other. Were they closer knit? So I wonder if that day hadn't, fallen on a day that they were supposed to enter a place of worship would they would everyone have shown up or would they have been find some other convenient uh, excuse to that they were unable to attend on that day would they hide their faith and their their nationality so that they wouldn't be killed do we do that do we hide our faith or our nationality as a, a citizen in the kingdom of god in our own lives, and would you would uh, they try and make apologies for what Mordecai had done? 
Do we try and make apologi- apologies for, you know, the, the, the doctrines of the Bible because of the change in the way people think now? Of course, all these, all these examples that I'm giving of Mordecai are really us. Will we stand up for God like Mordecai and Esther? Or will we find an excuse to make an apology for our faith? And really the choice, that choice, and the lesson this morning is yours. But I wonder what would happen if a letter like that came today for us. What would, what would we do? Would we, will you stand for God or, or will, uh, will you give in? So think about that as we uh, stand and sing the closing song. Yes, a sign when